It is 1793. The storm rages around them as they try with everything they have left. Exhausted, soaked, salt and sweat and blood blinding them to keep her from going over. This brig has been home for many of them. Even though they all knew the risk, they would rather be aboard the Clytus than anywhere else in the world. Well, almost. And now she was failing them. She was going to kill them if they weren't careful. The storm would force her onto her side. The rushing water would do the rest. Somewhere in the dark, occasionally looming with a dot of lamplight from a lone rider, was the east coast of Scotland. Too far to be helpful. Too close to not see the torn sails billowing in the light of thrown lanterns. Too close not to hear the cacophony of human disaster as a proud man-o'-war of the French Navy tried with everything she had not to give way and condemn her crew to either death or imprisonment. War was war. It didn't matter how the ship went down. The British would be happy that it did. The Clytus was dying her first death dashed on the rocks. This is Scotland, a podcast about history and where we made it. I'm Michael Park. It is 1807. You ignore your mother, risk the wrath of your father, if you could really call it a wrath, to watch the ships coming and going in the harbour. That's where you learn to love the sea, to love the way that it chopped and changed with every passing minute and at the whim of the wind. The ship navigates its way into the harbour, provided the wind is right, before a team of men take up ropes and pull her sideways into her berth. Every time you watch one arrive, it just gets more and more impressive. The family ship isn't so big really, but to you at just 14 years old, she's massive. Business is starting to boom for your father, and he's taking great pleasure in including you and your younger siblings in the success. He sits you down at night, and tells you that if things keep going his way, he's going to have a stunning brig built, which will be able to carry timber, limestone, coal, anything between the west coast of Scotland and the east coast of Ireland. Of course you were expected to keep up your lessons and your father would throw testing questions about cargo loads and average yields at you over dinner. You'd bat them back at him like an old hand. You were expected to help with the daily chores after you came home from school, but more often than not your mother would find you kicking your heels against the harbour wall and have to drag you home by your ear. After all, You were the oldest of eight, and if the others were to follow your example, then nothing would ever get done. So you scrubbed the floors, and you emptied the coal from the fire, and you went to fetch water. Doing what you were told was part of life. It is 1812, and the new ship is ready. You and your brothers and sisters sit on the harbour wall all day, waiting for your father. And then suddenly... It hoves into view on the horizon. Your father's new ship. The one he had dreamt of for years. And the one that would take the company to the next level. A beautiful, two-masted rig made from reclaimed timber. Its beautifully painted black hull dazzles in the morning sunlight. And the brand new white canvas of its sails flutters as it comes into port. The Clytus had risen, and she belonged to you. He was a real character, your dad. The kind of guy that took absolutely no crap from anyone, but also stood more than his fair share of rounds in the local. He now ran the biggest timber company in the area, shipping wood up and down the coast and away over to Ireland. And the second you finished school, you went to join him, taking over the books and the administration of the company and getting out on the water whenever you can. And there you stayed, day in, day out, 
six days a week with the odd Christmas day off for years, until you were in your thirties, your father was in his dotage, and your wee brother John had pretty much taken over the day-to-day -day running of the family business. The Clytus was a 14-hand cargo brig, and it was a little more luxurious than most, with the poop deck that was uncommon for a merchant ship of its size, a direct callback to its former life as a long-range warship. It was a sturdy, well-kept vessel with a good crew that knew what it was doing when the chips were down, and wee John was a competent ship's master, who had a bright future ahead of him, as the head of the Miller family. So it goes. One day in September 1833 he would head out from Salkots, with a few of the boys from the crew and his pal Gilchrist. Just a wee open sailboat for a day out with the lads on the horse aisle, just across from the town. Barely an inconvenience, he'd done it loads of times. And then, when they were coming home, the weather would pick up, the storm would get out ahead of them, and although they were all experienced sailors who tried to make for a safe harbour in Millport, the sea would swallow them all, and your life would never be the same again. Your father was in no fit state to take the wheel back, and you'd spent a fair bit of time at sea, so... You step aboard the Clytus. You, a forty-year-old woman, stand in front of the fourteen salty hands of the ship that you and your father sat around the kitchen table plotting to buy, planning the future, believing for every single second in the force of his ability to get it done. You look each of them dead in the eye, and they look back at you, dressed in all the finery of a Georgian lady, right down to the wee lacy bonnet. And the crew of the Clytus, in turn, say, Aye, ma'am, as you give the order and prepare for lunch. There's plenty of laughter and rolled eyes in your rival port of Irvin, but not a word is said in Saltcoats and Ardrossan, where they know you, Betsy Miller. The captain of the Clytus. The sea is in your blood and in the blood of your wee sister Hannah, who acts as your second in command. You go to sea without reputation, aside from being the only woman in command of a ship. Anywhere, as far as anyone can work out. But you gain a reputation for being fearless over the thirty odd years that the deck of the ship would become your home. The fourteen men of the Clytus know all about your proclivity for risk. Your battle cry I don't wait for the carry is seen by many as your two-fingered salute to the prevailing winds, which would make the life of most sea captains difficult on their sailing to Ireland. You knew that there's always money to be made, and make money you will. When you took over the company, the family had been heavily in debt, but you work and you work relentlessly, and you do everything you can to drag them all back to prosperity. Of course you'd sailed before, at any given opportunity, this wasn't something that an inexperienced sailor could do, especially not if you wanted to ignore the received wisdom of generations and beat the carry. But it's not about wanting to beat the prevailing wind and bring in more money than your peers, this isn't some challenge that you've set yourself, some misplaced bravado. You have to sail more. You have to trade more. Because the good old brig Clytus has more deaths to die. As we mentioned in the last couple of episodes, we've recently relaunched our Patreon, and we think it's one of the best value for money Patreons that you can join, to be honest. If you like Scotland, if you like sleep stories, if you enjoy Mitch's music and Jamie's art, then you can get them all on our new Patreon for as little as $3 a month. You really can't say fairer than that. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash bequietmedia and support us. It is 1839. The eye of a hurricane is quiet. The rest of it is very, very loud indeed, 
And as you look out over the harbour where the Clytus has been happily resting in its berth, you see the storm clouds forming. They say it's going to be a bad one. They have no idea. The late dreadful storm. We noticed in our last the tremendous hurricane that visited Glasgow and its neighbourhood on Monday morning last. Little damage was done here, but we have, unfortunately, another tale to tell respecting the sea in the South Country. The following is from a valued correspondent at Troon. To the editor of the Glasgow Chronicle, Troon, January the 8th, 1839, 4am. Sir, I beg to offer for insertion in your paper an account of a most disastrous storm that has been and is still raging here. It began about the evening of the 6th at south by west and gradually increased, veering round to the west. When about five on the morning of the 7th it seemed to have assumed more of the hurricane or tornadoes of tropical climates than even the most violent storms that have ever been experienced here. The harbour was unfortunately full of vessels, and some of them huge for coasters, and I am sorry to say that in about an hour after the tempest appeared to reach its height, the vessels began to break adrift from the harbour. To the seamen on board the feeling must have been awful, for though the moon was up there was little light, and the vessels were crashing against each other fearfully, carrying away masts, bowsprits, etc. A dozen had got adrift nearly about the same time, and several others soon followed. At daybreak the scene was truly distressing, upwards of twenty vessels on the strand, some filled with water, others filling, while shortly afterwards the seamen of some were seen on the rigging. There was a great apprehension that there might be a serious loss of lives, as it was thought that no boat could be pulled off to them, and the lifeboat was sent for to Irvine. But, dreading its late arrival, eight brave seamen manned a boat and proceeded to the vessels where the crew appeared to suffer most. The attempt was daring in the extreme from the outset, but after landing one boat full, there came a lull, and about forty seamen were thus landed. The lifeboat came in the afternoon and was used to take off four seamen from a vessel ashore in a more exposed situation, where a boat could not have been sent. About one, a small sloop was seen approaching a rocky shore, and soon came on with a terrible crash where she is likely to go to pieces. The crew were fortunately all saved. It is uncertain whether there are any drowned. We think there cannot be more than one or two. In the afternoon the storm abated, but towards night it increased, and has now for some time been raging at northwest, almost as heavy as ever, accompanied with heavy snow showers. And I am afraid the work of destruction only half begun on the previous night will by this morning be completed. Many have lost their little all, particularly sailors, who will be thrown out of employment with loss of clothes, etc. Vessels on shore are damaged at Troon, January the 8th, 1839. Dundonald of Troon, Dykes of Maryport, Waterloo Packet of Yarmouth, Margaret of Dundalk, Ariel of Aberdeen, Clytus of Saltcoats, Endeavour of Holyhead, Harmony of Troon. The Clytus was one of the ships ripped from its berth by hurricane-strength winds, leaving you to pick up the pieces, along with 33 other ships beached at Troon. Left with expensive repairs and no income, you were forced to laugh in the face of the carry. You were forced to take jobs that no one else would take in the worst of conditions, to put yourself back on track. The debts you had inherited with the company weren't going away any time soon, but now you had to pay for the extensive repairs to your ship which, by the whim of bad fortune, had been dashed on the sands at Troon, while your crew tried desperately to save her. The Clytus could die as many times as it wanted, you would always bring it back, it would always provide, whether it liked it or not. From 1833 to the day you retire in 1861, 
you ignore the received wisdom. You fight the carry. You make the runs that others refuse to make. You're Betsy Miller. You're the captain. A Glasgow paper notices the demise of Miss Betsy Miller, aged 71, whose life and labours have often been quoted as illustrative of what a right-minded, earnest and indefatigable woman can do in order to discharge a debt and earn an honourable maintenance. Miss Miller was a daughter of the late Mr W Miller, for a long time a ship owner and wood merchant in Saltcoots. In her younger years, she acted as a clerk and ship's husband to her father, but when business affairs took an unfavourable turn, with a resolution which truly might be called heroic, she took command of an old brig, the Clytus, and became sailing master. So successful was her career that she enabled to pay off a debt of £700, which her father's estate owed, maintain herself in comfort, and bring up two sisters left dependent upon her. The Clytus traded between Ardrossan and the coast of Ireland for more than 30 years. She transacted all the business connected with freight, cargo, and ships course through all weathers. The Leeds Times, 21st of May, 1864. Your younger sister Hannah would go on as master of the Clytus for as long as she could, but she didn't love the job in the same way that you did. It didn't help her to find herself, and the ship would be sold in 1876 for £122 and broken up, the final death of the good old brig. You've been listening to Scotland. It was written and produced by me, Michael Park, and is a production of Be Quiet Media. This episode takes inspiration from The Captain and Crinoline and The Lady Mariners by the late great Joan Bigger. The voice of Betsy Miller was by Faye Jarden. The music for every episode of Scotland is by Mitch Bain. You can check out more of his work at mitchbain.bequiet.media. Jamie Mowat does stunning illustrations for us, which you can see in our episode art. See more and buy prints at tidlin.com. Scotland is supported by Chris Lingwood and listeners like you on Patreon. You can get loads more from us for as little as $3 a month at patreon.com forward slash bequietmedia. You can find out more about the show and read transcripts on our website, scotlandpodcast.net, and on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram by searching Scotland, a Scottish history podcast. Thanks for listening. Look after each other. Wear a mask. Get vaccinated if you can. We'll see you next time. Hold on, lads. I'll gang below and put on a clean sark. I'd like to be flung up in the sun's half-decent. They are when folks are nasty noticing bodies.